the Black Mile that I shot last year was would have to be the most memorable, without a doubt. How heavy was that? It was 30 kg or something, wasn't it? <laughs> Well, it was 154.9 kilos. Oh, you throw that back. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad because I, I was waiting for you to say it was 155 and I was going to say, Nick, are you exaggerating? <laughs> I knew you were going to do it. That's why I said it properly. <laughs> <laughs> G'day guys, welcome to today's new Spiro podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Shrek. I'll be joined by Turbo with this interview with champion Australian woman Spira, uh, Nikki Watt. And this is a absolute crack up interview. Turbo and Nikki gang up on me a little bit and uh, it's got a very Australian flavour, uh, which which I actually enjoyed uh, being part of and uh, and these guys have a good laugh. It's good fun. Um, look, Nikki is is she's a real she's a real passionate spirit. The way she um, has developed her observation skills stands out loud and clear in this interview. Um, if you're a woman interested in improving your spearfishing, I think you're going to pick up a lot of things from this interview. And even if you're a bloke, you're going to learn heaps because she's a very clever and um, and she has some interesting approaches to things and the way she thinks about. Um, Everything from hunting techniques to spearfishing equipment. So it's a great interview. Uh, she's the current world record holder for Black Marlin. 155 kg, 335 pounds. Uh, huge fish. And uh, she is definitely an interesting character. This is a cracker interview. Let's let's just get into it today. We'll get straight into it. Here is our interview with Nikki Watt. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash Noob Spiro. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or MP3 player. Get a couple of books that Turbo and I are both like. The Tim Ferriss books, uh, 4-Hour Workweek and The 4-Hour Body are both available. I also like the look of uh, Undisputed Truth by Mike Tyson. Now check that out at audibletrial.com forward slash Noob Spiro. A big thank you to our sponsor, Adreno. Adreno are one of the world's biggest and best spearfishing stores. They stock a huge range of gear, more than you can imagine. So check them out in store at Brisbane, Sydney, and Melbourne, or get online. If you like your shopping online, check them out at spearfishing.com.au, where you can save $20 on all purchases over $200 when you check out using the code Noob Spiro. So get online and check them out at spearfishing.com.au and use the code Noob Spiro at checkout. Well, welcome to the show, Nikki. Uh, we've had a little bit of a chat beforehand. It's really nice to have you with us today. Um, Turbo is um, in his nighty and dressing gown over there in Brisbane. I am in uh, Omaru, New Zealand. Where are you today? I am in Port Lincoln, South Oz. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Jeez, awesome. I bet it's a bit chilly. It is. I'm actually sitting out the front of Greg Pickering's abalone shed, to be precise. Oh, nice. No way, a bit of spearfishing royalty. Yeah, I've left Bryson inside. I'm sitting in the car chatting to you two lovely fellas. Well, you know, after this, when this finishes, if it's been a good interview and you've had a good time, you, it'd be really nice if you just swag it in there and ask Greg if he'd come on the show because we've been chasing him for a little while. Oh, saying. yeah. I'll get him to come out. We could do a truck and trailer. He could just go right after you. That'd be fine. Um, and I, who are you travelling with, Nikki? Um, I'm travelling with Bryson Sheehy and normally our Labrador, but she's up in North Queensland at the moment. So, yeah, we're travelling Australia in a troopy. Oh, wicked. Why is the Labrador missing out? Uh, we had a bunch of weddings and things on and... We're doing all the national park spots at the moment, so it worked out a lot easier just to send her up to my parents for a short holiday yep. and she'll come back and join us in October. Mate, I've seen pictures of the troopy. For those that don't know it, what is it? Explain it and what's it called? This is gold. Okay, so it's a green troop carrier, Land Cruiser Troop Carrier 78 Series. Um, we re-sprayed it green, as I said, and the number plates are job fish. A lot of people <laughs> think, yeah, a lot of people think we work fishing or something, but no. And we cut the roof off and convert it into a bit of a camper. It's got hot water, solar, everything you could need. 
That That's pretty wicked. awesome. And yeah. our, you guys have got a boat, or Bryson's got a boat. Yep, um, so we're towing his boat as well. He's pretty imaginative. Can you explain that boat? Because <laughs> he's got it. Yeah, it's a 19-foot Hanes. It's yellow. It's called Goldfish. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping it very, simple. Very clever stuff, guys. <laughs> And, uh, and and for all of you listeners wondering what the hell's going on, this is Turbo talking to another Australian girl and they're just using Australian language nonstop. So it's fantastic. Um, Nikki, where did, where did you grow up and where did you get started spearfishing? Um, I grew up in the Burdekin, which is a cane farming district in North Queensland, just south of Townsville. So I sort of grew up in a rural location. I went to school there. And then I left when I was 17, moved to Townsville and went to uni. And then I started spearfishing more around Lucinda and all the reefs and the Palm Island group from there. Right. You know, Nikki, that's actually where I got ciguateras off uh, Trunk Reef. Oh, yeah. you got to watch out. But yeah. Oh, thanks for telling me now. I believe that. I think yeah. I've had a mild case from, well, from cold trout, but from the outer reefs yep. from there. Yeah, no, and they actually, uh, I read somewhere uh, online that years ago they sent um, a big Maori wrasse, or what do they call them, a Napoleon wrasse, down mm-hmm. for a, they had some Chinese people over from Sydney and they sent two of them down and they poisoned 40 people with that fish. Oh, Incredible. wow. And that and that's where it came from, yeah. Wow. So you're a bit sport though, Nikki. That's a beautiful part of the world to start spearfishing in. Um, what? How old were you in? And sort of like tell us a little bit about what that journey was like. So I was 20, I think. Yeah, I was 20 when I started spearfishing. And up until then, I hadn't really done much, well, at all really, in the way of snorkeling even. Like a little bit of snorkeling and fishing and crabbing and that sort of thing. But I was sort of thrown into the deep end a little bit. I just went out on the boat one day with – an ex-boyfriend, and, yeah, just jumped in and had a go. And obviously on the first few goes you you had a, had a, a good time because you've, you've, you've gone back for more. Yeah, so um, I guess the first couple of times was pretty awkward in terms of, you know, getting used to the water, being comfortable in the water, that sort of thing. Um, but, yeah, when I sh- shot my first fish, it definitely – took you know took away being stung by jellyfish because i'm wearing board shorts and all the <laughs> cuts on my feet from wearing bins that were duct taped to my feet and <laughs> you know, all that sort of stuff yeah it's um, great yeah so it's definitely a good feeling and yeah it it was worth the high to go back again and again okay so what was that fish what happened um the first fish was a coral trout um i think it was just a common and then I was stoked and then I just thought, you know, everything was good eating after that. And I think the next next fish I shot was a slady brim, which was massive. <laughs> I loved Lovely. it. Lovely. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So with your with your coral trout, did you just dive bomb it and shoot it from the top? Was it? Was it- yeah, well, pretty much I ha- definitely had it pointed out to me. I, I don't know how it stayed where it was. It was just sitting there and I was splashing about and, yeah, I just got it and I think I shot it really high. So it was moments from tearing out and somehow I managed to land it. So, yeah, I definitely dive-bombed it without a doubt. Can you remember, like, I, I, like you said you didn't have much experience snorkeling and stuff, so I take it you had possibly some free diving issues when you got started. Yeah, so I I couldn't even equalise below two metres until I had some practice and I really thought about keeping hydrated and that sort of thing. But to be honest, I don't know how I didn't bust my eardrum shooting that trout. You were literally diving down and the pressure on you is just building, building, but you oh, thought, definitely. whatever, I'll just go for it. Oh, that's so Definitely. Bad. I had no yeah. idea. No idea whatsoever. It's amazing how common that is. Like once you've been diving for a while, you just take that sort of for granted or if you've been diving in a pool or whatever, you take it for granted. But there's so many people out there that are just pushing through that pain. Oh, for like, sure. I used, yeah. to do it, I used to do it every year in the dive pool. The dive pool at my local uh, swimming pool was four metres deep. And in the start of summer when we started swimming, I'd have sore ears for the first two weeks. And then all of a sudden you'd get used to it. We'd get down on the bottom in four metres with no equalising. And uh, like you hear it now, it's just like that's yeah. terrible, you know, but that's how we start some of us. So, so how, how, did you, how did you work it out? 
How did you work out how to equalise? I don't even know. I just kept blowing and I think I was probably a bit silly because I didn't realise I would blow too much air. So then I would blow, I would lose bottom time because I was trying to equalise too much. So I think just after eight, like years of, well, probably a couple of years of practice, I learned to equalise before I dived, equalised as I was going down and then just just little, like more constant little puffs. I just noticed that that was working a lot better. Mm. Um, but just, just time in the water and just, I guess, being more conscious, or like thinking about it more and more and just talking to some people about it really probably – refined it for me for sure for sure so so were you doing this for years oh i don't know i don't know it was 10 years ago now it's hard to think about it oh definitely like i guess i would have started off pretty slowly i would have only gone a couple of times in the first year and then yeah i guess the more i went the more i started to notice it but oh definitely probably by the second year i hope i was getting better awesome and you you mentioned staying hydrated how how important has that been to equalizing oh massive especially in the tropics i've noticed that down where i am at the moment it's not so much of a problem but in summer where i'm from the water temperature is somewhere in the 30s on the surface And, you know, that mixed with all the salt water and being on the boat all day, I was just, I think I was at first drinking too much water and not enough like hydrolyte and things like that. Gatorade doesn't really work for me, but definitely hydrolyte and just eating light foods during the day for a little bit of energy, nothing too heavy. Chia pods I found were really, really good. So they're, you buy them pre-made and it's just with coconut water or coconut milk no it's definitely coconut water and you can get different flavors like vanilla or chocolate or yeah banana i think but i really that's what i used to eat all the time on the boat up there okay yeah, right. Cool. all right so doritos gotcha all right. <laughs> um. <laughs> and snakes snakes with smoke yeah, doritos right snakes. Snakes. Yeah. yeah classic boat food and uh, normally the, so, the the boys are looking around for the Doritos at lunchtime, but they're already gone if I'm on the boat. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm not looking forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> the Doritos bill certainly goes up. So, like, you, you, you're better with equalising and you had to learn the freediving the hard way. Can you remember any of the other big lessons you learned starting out? Oh, gear. Gear was the worst thing ever. I learnt to always take care of my own gear because there's nothing worse than getting out to the reef 60, 70 k's out with no snorkel. I had to <laughs> use an old fuel line one day, believe it or not. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Oh, that's so, okay. yeah, that was great. Did it have fuel in it? Because that's pretty much how Turbo went through high school. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, there were definitely remnants. It still had... <laughs> Oh, it's yeah. It was crap. It definitely, it definitely had fuel still in it. That's, That's rough. rough. That's yeah. rough. Yeah. No, I, I think, I think personal responsibility with your gear is, is a big one. You know, like no one else is going to look after it for you unless you've got a podcast co-host who likes re-rigging your gun every couple of months. So, oh, Nikki, you have no idea. This guy had a roller gun, and he's got. You know, he's got pineapples for hands. <laughs> and, um, to, to rigging on that gun. Oh, you've never seen anything like it. Like, I, I'm not... Uh, I'm not so into rigging and all that stuff, but when I saw this, like, what little amount of OCD I had in me just flipped out. This thing was just horrible. It was like a spider's web of Dyneema, and he was trying <laughs> oh. to convince me that it was still functional. It was shocking. <laughs> Oh, no, I still fine. shoot it's, shoot bulk oh, fish, bro. No, it's bro. fine, bro. I'm just not a gear guy. That's <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a good accent too. Well done. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks. I've been practicing. So, so from so from then till now, Nikki, um, you know, what other changes have you seen with with your gear and stuff? Like you said, you started taking care of it for yourself. What what else have you done? Um, the best thing I did was change from big heavy plastic fins to a nice light composite or carbon blade with foot pockets that actually fit me. That made a massive difference to me. Yeah, that's a huge one. Oh, that was that was probably the most, I guess, game changing thing for me. I think guns, you can set any gun up right, I think, if you spend en- enough time with it. Did did you have a mentor? Not really. I think 
it's I was thinking about that the other day and it's hard because when I first started I feel like I was guided ever so like not much at all I wasn't really guided I don't feel so I just feel like I flump you know stumbled about for a while and then I sort of got to talk to a few people and I think the only time I really sought out some mentorship was when I first when I did my first national titles I talked to a couple of local guys from our club um, Michael Panache and Adam Smith who just gave me an insight into the comp scene and how you've got to strategize and how you should go about approaching it but other than that just I don't know just divers over the years like a whole range of divers have helped me different from different walks of life different I guess grounds different parts of Australia so yeah hey, do, you, do you find that um when you in your new and you're fresh and you're going out someone says oh, they'll take you out you get there as a newbie and they just ditch you is that what you sort of found? Because like every, everyone wants to shoot a fish, right? And, and everyone's there, you get limited time on the water, that no one really wants to hang around with the newbie. I guess so. But I had a lot of trouble even being invited in the first place because nobody wants to upset their wife. Taking, oh. yeah. <laughs> Taking a girl out. I oh, never wow. thought of that. It's a whole nother ball game. Whole nother ball game. Like I went away to titles and had to share accommodation with same a group of men because let's face it there's I was the only girl in our club and it was a massive drama to even just share a room with me you sure, you sure it's not just you Nikki you well sure? maybe <laughs> but it just doesn't make it, yeah just honestly it's a whole nother dynamic and like to the point where like if we were traveling two hours out to a reef and, you know everyone has a piss stop halfway it was a mm. drama for me to go to the toilet like I've been told not to do it no. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. There is no facilities out there, so th- there is a bit of uh, a bit of that, a fair bit of that. <laughs> but I don't care. And, like, I have no problems with it. It, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't bother me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, like the guys that I have dived with, I've never really, I've never felt that they never wanted to. I've I've always tried to dive with people that work as a team, and that's been the most, I guess, rewarding. Yeah in fish like what we'd get the times that i have dived with guys that have gone off by themselves you can't really do much about it okay no yeah and it's uh yeah we all know someone that does it and it's it's uh, it just starts to get irritating i find after a while because you feel like something's going to go wrong and you and you feel like well shit i'm going to be responsible if we don't start reining them in yeah um oh definitely you know, and I think that puts pressure particularly on your body, and I think it's really unfair to do that to your body. So, mm. anyway, just my thoughts. No, nah, it's, it's a good point about being part of a regular crew too, and it's why a lot of new guys and girls have trouble finding finding places to go out because a lot of guys have got their crews dialed in. Everyone knows how each other behave. They can rely on each other, and that's kind of what you want when you go out spearfishing. But it's hard to bust into the scene sometimes, and it sounds like you had a few more struggles than us. Yeah, oh, it was definitely not easy. What club did you join? Is that Cairns Underwater? No, I'm um, a part of the Townsville Skin Diving Club. Okay, okay. And tell us tell us a bit about them. Um, so they meet once a month. There's people from Townsville, Ingham, and I think there's even members in Brisbane, to be honest. It's not a massive club. I think there's probably only about 30 members at the moment. Okay. Um, pretty young membership base. Um They're actually running or organising the Queensland titles this year, which will be run from Lucinda. Um, Generally, yeah, a good bunch of guys, a good amount of experience and knowledge within the club. There's actually some nice proactive things happening in terms of we now have a freediving instructor which can be used for training or whatever purposes you like. Okay. Um, did that do, do you some big big favors when you were starting out, like joining a club? When I first joined the club, there was a lot of a lot of old guys in it that were probably a bit stuck in their ways. But yeah, as yeah. they sort of filtered out and the new blood came through, it was a lot better, definitely a yeah, lot better. Yeah. And that's yeah. where, like, I got all of my advice for comps and stuff like that. Even not necessarily just comps, like anything about the local 
what's going on and that sort of thing. Yeah, I definitely, I'm definitely glad I joined the club and I met some really good people there. And I would, okay. I would do it again. I would join another club again, yeah. wherever I am. Yeah. We, we've we've struggled um, really getting a good club in Brisbane, and uh, the Southeast Queensland's pretty like. Uh, well, I know there's a club down the Tweed, and and you know the Brisbane area and the Sunshine Coast is not much going on at the moment. So it's it's, it's a tough environment for new guys because clubs help it help out in a huge way. The club that you're talking about at Tweed has a heavy underwater hockey base as well, ah, okay. which is really good. I love it, and it's really good training if you're um yeah not getting out enough. For sure, for sure. I like it. Uh, it's good. It's good fun. Um, Turbo really likes just guys in speedos, um, just smashing their bums into his face at times. Um, that's the real. That's a, that's a real highlight for him. Um, but now we've talked. We've talked to a few underwater hockey guys over the years, and uh, it's. I think it's a great tool for um, for spiros, especially like if you're not getting out that much, and it's a good, good, good for your finning and fitness and all that sort of stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. You always wear board shorts to underwater hockey, Shrek, and it always disappoints me. Oh, <laughs> I don't want to go anymore. I'm extremely shy. And, uh, <laughs> and the way you huddle in the, the – we're talking about going to the toilet on the boat before. We've never seen uh, anyone huddle ha- in the back corner like <laughs> Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wrong with a good huddle. He's very shy. Yeah. <laughs> He's very yeah, sure. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I could tell a story about that, but I won't. Um all right, let's 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 hook into memorable fish. Um tell us about a memorable fish that you've shot. Um what species was it and where were you? The most memorable? Yes, let's do that. All right. Well definitely definitely the marlin, the black marlin I shot last year was would have to be the most memorable, without a doubt. So how, like how, 30, how heavy 30, was that? It was thirty K G or something, wasn't it? <laughs> well, it was 154.9 kilos. Oh, you throw that back. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad because I, I was waiting for you to say it was 155 and I was going to say, Nick, are you exaggerating? <laughs> I knew you were going to do it. That's why I said it properly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a predictable uh, show. Anyway. Uh, look, so a black right, Tell us all about it. That's a monster. It was a monster. Yeah, well... I'm surprised it played out the way it did. We missed the alarm thanks to daylight savings. Oh. And um, it was a wild and windy day out from Tarthra, which is south coast New South Wales, and went out to the shelf. We were trying to use teasers, but it was too rough. Um, the birds weren't working properly because they couldn't see anything thanks to the white caps. And, yeah, it was just a long, long day. And then – sort of, oh, was it mid-afternoon, um, saw the tiniest bit of a seal's fin and got in front of the bait school, jumped in, saw the seals, saw the slimies, and then just to the left this big marlin came in and, it yeah, it happened so quickly and I just managed to get close enough to good, put a good shot on it and then about an hour later I had it up and the Bodhi, who Ryan Pauline, he was really quietly spoken guy and he was he yelled out, get in the boat. And I thought, oh, no, what is it? And there was a big white shark. Oh. And he doesn't exaggerate. He said eight foot between fin and dorsal. So wow. that was a big shark. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then that was it. 150, yeah, five kilo fish in the boat. Not a common, well, not super common down there. It's sort of the home of the striped marlin. Um, mm. where, where was that fish in relation to you when you put the shot on it? Where was it? Uh, it was coming from the left and it was probably about six metres from me and I had okay. to swim at it pretty fast because it was coming in towards the bait ball, which was sort of to my right. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So what did you shoot it with? What sort of gear? Like um, big roller, big... No, multi-band gun, what was it? Yeah, so it was an 1100 inverted roller by Manny Sub. Yep. So it's a carbon oh, yeah. gun with an 8.5 mil slip tip and I had a 30-metre rigid rig line and a 50-metre bungee and I was using it on a Tommy Bother float, which is a thick foam, I guess, boogie board shape float with a one-way 
complete system. So like a no return. Yep. And the idea with that is the way the marlin are out there, there's no bottom, there's hundreds of metres of water, so it's not really, you know, going to get caught on anything. But rather than me fighting such a big fish, you're better off letting the marlin fight itself. So when you've got 50 metres of bungee with, say, a three-to-one stretch, it will fight itself. So that was most of the time spent in that hour was letting it run, gaining some rope, letting it run, gaining some rope and continuously doing that, um, which allowed me to then tie it off when the fish was at about 15 metres, get down and second shoot it just to make sure it was dead. And then Mm -hmm. not only – so not only did I – like once it's just sitting there dead, it's just this massive dead weight in the water. So it's not extremely easy to pull up a negatively buoyant fish like that. So – I actually ended up pulling it up with my rig uh, with my reel gun. Um, so as I pulled it up, I'd clip, I'd I'd tighten the drag, and I actually had my gun clipped off to the float as well. And that was yeah, that was the only way I could pull it up. So I'd have to pull it up, kick, tie it off, pull it up, kick, tie it off before it like reached that neutral and positive, and then I could sort of lift it up pretty easily. Um, wow. Well, yeah. yeah. Big struggle. There's a couple of other facts I like about this story. Number one, you you beat Ian Puckeridge's uh, long-standing record. Number two, it's it's the current women's world record. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yep. So that's yeah. IUSA and IBSRC. So there's two bodies that govern the world records. There's the IUSA, which is for all fish, and the IBSRC is a blue water spearfishing mob um, oh, run by okay. Terry Mass. And yeah, so that's cool. Women's world yeah. record. That that is a very memorable fish story. Um, I, c- I can only imagine doing something like that. That would, one hour to get the bloody thing in. That's a that's a mission. Yeah, well, definitely, definitely. The um, yeah, that's that's a really nice gun. I've seen uh, our our good mate Steve Jamizic has that uh, eleven hundred money sub gun. Um, that we, but the biggest thing I've ever seen him shoot with it was a uh, big spangled emperor from about seven <laughs> meters out. <laughs> so if you can't, if you can't hold your breath, just get yourself a really <laughs> big, powerful gun. It oh, makes God. up for a lot of distance. I just <laughs> like it because when I was like diving the shelf up north, those big cannons, you just can't get them around quick enough and like shooting tuna and things like that. They're just so much more maneuverable and they're strong and lightweight and they're easy to travel with. Like, oh, I love it. I love that gun. Yeah, it's it's a really smart gun, hey, because you, if you are missing or, or whatever, like to load that gun is surprisingly easy as long as you know what you're doing. Yeah, definitely. That's, you know, like it's like the, the bands feel so easy to load as compared to, say, a six banded friggin' cannon block of wood thing that's just sort of cumbersome and, yeah, horrible. They're, they're very impressive, sort of outfit, aren't they? Definitely. Definitely. All right, cool. Oh. Um, next section of the show What's your favourite species to hunt and why? Oh, God. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It's so diverse like I love blue water but I also love inshore stuff up home like finger mark and barra um oh why don't we talk about finger mark yeah we've never talked about finger mark yeah yeah I I, I recently did a trip up uh into cent- central Queensland with um Larry Gray the original penetrator mm-hmm. and um and uh, he <laughs> shot a stonker of a um, of a finger mark, like this thing was huge, you know, like just a big giant golden mangrove jack looking thing, and um, yeah, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on on hunting finger mark and sort of where you find them and how you go about targeting those fish. Well, hang on, um, I wanted to oh, say, can God. you de- can you describe the species a little bit more just for our international sort of listeners? Like, I mean, it's a canny reef species. Well, what's the kind of size and and coloration and all the rest of it? So they're like a golden orange colour and they have a black spot sort of towards the back on the yeah, on its back. That right. is why it gets its name finger mark. I think the best the, the I liken them to what the Americans call um, uh, a mangrove snapper, but golden essentially. 
Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, Yeah. and they even look quite silver in the water, depending on where you're getting them. All right, well... All right, how do, how do we go about finding them and, uh, and like, habitat and how do you go about hunting finger mark? Um, well, they can be on wrecks in 30 metres of water or they can be on headlands, on pressure points, um, usually dirty water. I've shot them. I mean, inshore up there, it's very, very rare to get a nice clean day inshore. Um, but... You can get them on shoals. You can get them on little lumps on the bottom. Um, they school up, or sometimes there's just one or two, to, or two or three together. Yep. Um, best ways to dive to the bottom, and yeah, just try and try and hit those pressure points, um, or yeah, dive the so, front edge of the wrecks. So for for a new diver starting out, pressure point. What's a pressure point? Um, a pressure point is where like your currents or tides are hitting like square on and there's like a build up of fish or nutrients in the water that they're they're hanging out there for a reason they're feeding there or hunting there or something like that so nice so so basically the front the front edge of a reef or um, wreck where your current hits first yep that's where you're gonna find these fish oh maybe they come sometimes they come in from the sides i don't know they it varies sometimes they're, they're there like i've been laying on a bommy and there's nothing there and then all of a sudden there's like 10 of these fish just swimming over the top of me like schooling up they're, they're yep. just swimming in and out sometimes um they might yep. move around a little bit they don't just sit there like an emperor or something yep. they definitely can so, move around and are they forgiving? Like, I mean, are they? Do they scatter quickly, or say if you miss a shot, are they going to hang around? Like, what's the behaviour? Oh, they might go away, but they'll come back. They'll come back. Okay. Yeah, definitely. You better off get that one on the first shot and hit it well, so it doesn't scare the school too much. Right. Yeah, but Ooh. you've got to be careful. Like, they will. If it's a bigger fish, you will need to pull it out of the wreck pretty quickly, or you will have to pull it out because it might hole up. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. They're, they, they're not the most powerful fish, but they've definitely got a bit of grunt behind them, so you want to pull it up and at least get it out of the structure quickly. Okay. Oh. All right. Ex- excellent. I'm more confused when we started, but... Um... It, it's a perfectly <laughs> I think it was a terrible example. <laughs> You asked. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. It was my question. Um, yeah, no, I'm sort of getting it. Yeah, putting it together I, I think if you're not careful, Turbo, Nikki's going to put a finger mark on you. All right, let's oh, move on. <laughs> dad joke number three. Uh, for our number listeners, three. You've missed two classic I got plenty dad more of me. I told you I was just winding before up. Before we got Riley, and this is his third for the whole interview. Absolute yeah. like ripper. Yeah, I'm famous for him as well. Guys, Spearing Magazine have joined the Noob Spiro podcast to bring this episode to you today. Now, Spearing Magazine are, they're, they're actually, they're the best spearfishing magazine in the world. I'm saying it, Turbo said it, now you know it. And uh, <laughs> if you head over to Spearing Magazine, you can check out the team. They've got Jeremy Gamble, John Paul Castro, Sky Bailey, Christopher Landers. You have a look, there's some f- fantastic people they've got on staff, and that's why they produce the world's best spearfishing magazine, the photography it's just popping. The stories are awesome. Turbo's been rejected several times, and uh, that's how you know it's top quality. So head over to SparingMagazine.com. You can buy it. You can buy it at your local retailer in the US, or you can, you can even get the digital subscription online. SparingMagazine.com. Shrek, what's our next question, mate? Look, toughest situation. So what's the toughest situation you've been in in the ocean and um, what actions did you take and, and what was the result? And most important, what did you learn from it? Hmm, there was two tough situations that I can't really put my finger on, which was the worst. But the first one, we were on the shelf up north and we were blue water diving. So we had three in the water, um, two on the big guns, one on burley. Once again, rough um, for some reason, the guy on the burley forgot to bring his gun in the water and the other guy had just missed a fish. So he was unloaded and all the reef sharks, which were in the burley trail had scattered and disappeared, which was super strange. It was that funny time of day where you look up and the, and the first say meter of water is overexposed 
and a bit hard to see through because of the particles in the water. And there was this massive tiger shark right behind the burly guy. And it was that rough. He was actually vomiting in the water at the time. And... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And they're okay. both, and both these guys are face forward in the drift, so not really looking behind. And I just, oh, the gut on this shark, shark was massive. And I'm yelling out to them, hey, hey, hey. And they finally realized and saw it. And then these two are hiding behind me. And this shark <laughs> was just, yeah, it realized uh, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, we knew it was there. And, um, I was yelling out to the Brody, come over, come over. And they thought I was just getting excited because I do get really excited. And I kept yelling and yelling and yelling. And then they'd finally saw the fin of this shark sticking out of the water. So he came over and um, every time he got close to us, this shark would put itself between us and the boat. So we just couldn't get in the boat and like it, it, and then finally I got in, one of the burly guy got in. And then for some reason, this other guy who was on shooter gun with an unloaded gun thought it was a really good idea to poke off oh. this shark instead of getting in the boat. Like the duck board's oh. right there and he was not getting in the boat. And we were, we were seconds from pulling this guy in and oh, – it was it was pretty close. He got in and the shark was pissed off and we went to another reef, was probably about two or three Ks away, so it was pretty close. And within moments we got in the water and it was back. Yeah. It was right. back wow. in the water. Yeah. Yeah. So that was although nothing, you know, it was pretty controlled. Um but I'm interested to know what would have happened if we didn't re- notice it was there in the water. Or because it was summer, and they they do tend to get a bit more aggressive out there, but we survived. And yeah, the other one also in summer, we just had this epiphany that we were gonna we were just going to drive to the sea mount. I don't know if you know how far away that is, no, but no. it's oh, what is it? It's from Marion Harbour, which is Innisfail. It must be about 150 k's. I oh, have to double wow, check wow. that. What, 150 k's offshore. Yeah. Yep. Right. And what and, were you going in? Uh, a 23 foot Pride, which is a fiberglass boat, and we had an auxiliary motor, and we were pretty. We had heaps of jerrys on, and it was looking like there was going to be a run of good weather. So it was really the only chance we were going to get. So anyway, we started making our way out there and it was a time of year where the squalls come through and they pass and you sort of just get over that. But we got about halfway out and it was getting pretty rough and we thought, oh, we might have to call it on the seamount. We'll just dive some of these reefs. And we either had to leave then, which was at 1 p.m., or we had to wait until the next tide to get in for whatever reason. I can't remember why. Anyway, everyone wanted to stay except me. And we decided to stay and the sky became green and bad. Mm. Anyway, we decided to <laughs> go back in. Anyway, we slogged in, took us a few hours and we could just start to make out the cliffs of Marine Harbour. And we did a bush on the engine and oh. – Yeah, it was pretty bad, and there's lightning striking all around us with that green sky, and um, somehow we managed to get the anchor out without falling overboard because it was that sort of sloppy swell. And then, yeah, we managed to putt in with the auxiliary, thank God. It was the only day we've ever had that auxiliary out there, but I'm so glad we did because, I don't know, no one was coming. We, we, We... limped into the harbour and all the professional fishermen were looking at us like you idiots what are you doing did you even have a clue yeah. so um that was pretty close that was pretty close um but yeah that's about it any 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 takeaways from those situations well just be more aware of what could happen during those stormy months um and just if you're diving blue water or anywhere just make sure you're all prepared that you're constantly looking around because you don't know what you can't see. 
just and, have to and, keep and, all eyes in all directions. And an auxiliary or a backup plan's a, a great idea. It saved your ass. Yeah, wow. Definitely. Well, I would actually, after that incident, we we were hiring sat phones and you can do that. You can hire sat phones for a weekend and through our club, you could buy a high one for 50 bucks. So when you split oh, that wow. amongst a crew, it's nothing. It's, it's very worth it. Very worth it. You know, the reefs up at home, the, the closest yeah. ones are 60 Ks out. So yeah, that's a good deal. All right, cool. We're going to, we're going to double up on hunting techniques this episode because mm. for, for veterans vault, uh, which which is our kind of our guest sort of um, subject matter um, discussion point. We wanted to talk about hunting pelagics with you, so let, let's let's hook in. Okay, what sort of pelagics? Like ev- anything in particular? Let's go for some of the easy wins that everyone wants. Um, let's talk about Spanish mackerel or king mackerel, and maybe um, wahoo. Well, there's heaps of different ways, I guess, you could do it. But you can drift edges of reefs, once again, onto the pressure points with flashes. That's always a really good technique for Spanish. Off any, like, reef edge where there's life and pressure points, once again, you're, you're going to find them. Um, you can burly up for them. You can, yeah, I, I love using, using flashes, without a doubt. You don't need to have a super powerful gun. You can shoot them with a 1200 double rubber real gun or float line if that's something you're more comfortable with um mid body shots are good they have a bit of a softer flesh so you just want to be careful not to tear them out they have very sharp teeth so be very careful when you do grab them i like i like straight shaft on them as opposed to slip tips Mm -hmm. things like that why is that is that because the 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 tip itself cuts through the flesh and pulls out or is it just not necessary or what's the story there? If you don't get a good shot on the spine, if you've shot high or low, you're more likely to tear the fish because you've got, well, I always use cable on my slip tips and they can, they can just pull out, um, like tear the fish. Um, and sometimes oh, I'm yet to, decide which what i believe on this but if you've got like a tri cut or a pencil tip slip sometimes the tri cuts can can cut the flesh um so yeah but i mean if you've got a good shot on it, it's fine and if you're out there chasing dog tooth or other things anyway that's probably what you're gonna have uh, on it well i would have that yeah. on it i know um guys are running with double floppers for dog tooth and stuff now but um i would I would choose a double flopper shaft, at least an eight mil shaft for say Wahoo, which is similar to, to Spanish, but I've shot Spanish with seven mil um, single floppers before and it's been fine. So yeah, especially if you, if you're shooting it, like also if you want to be conscious of not bending your shafts and things like that, if you shoot with a bit of an angle, so say like, pointing forward you're less likely to bend your shafts and things like that um, yep sure and <clears throat> behaviorally underwater uh how, how do you approach them like what are some i guess some tips for not spooking them or keeping them within range are, are you going to get a second pass from them what do you, what's your advice sometimes there? sometimes they do so don't bomb dive them that's not really going to work unless mm-hmm. like you if you're above them you can sort of get away with diving down sort of next to them. But if you're down there, especially if you're between them and the flasher, they might, like if you dive down and then sort of swim to the left or right of them, they might follow you around because they're sort of wondering what you're doing. So if you dive and swim sort of to the left, I've noticed they will come around. And then if you can just slowly, I guess, kick closer to them as it's coming around, that, that works. It works for me. Um, if you're going slow enough, they're not going to spook. If you just, yeah, if you're just going slow, That's if you're going to kick, huh, yeah, if you kick, if you're going to kick um, and moving around a lot or waving your gun around a lot, it's not going to work. Do you, do you find that they're like say North Queensland, certain times of the year, they're happy to, like they sort of just show up and hang around you, and then other times they're just cruising and you either take the shot when they're there or you don't, and you don't get a second chance. Oh, yes, but then I don't know if it's not just the time of year or if it's the tide. I think the tides can affect it 
the current, I, I, I don't know. I think there's more to it than the time of the year. I mean, we definitely have a better pelagic season sort of end of September, November to do, to November. Um, but, mm. yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. With either mackerel or wahoo, did you have any specific problems like with shooting them successfully when you started hunting them? Specific problems I've had with both are sharks. They're just crazy on the shelf up home. So banish mackerel have definitely had more luck because you can they, they seem far more prominent on the inshore reefs as well as the off, offshore reefs. In saying that, just the locality of Spanish mackerel was, I guess, more of a sure thing. They don't come in as close as they would, say, Brisbane way. You have to go out a lot wider to get Wahoo. What would that be, like 70 to 80 k's out? Oh, wow. But, yeah, definitely <laughs> the sharks are such a problem out there. I guess I think the mackerel were happier to come in closer to the Burley Trail and the Flasher. The Wahoo seemed to be a little bit more scared or they'd, they'd wise on a lot quicker. You, we were only getting Wahoo sort of the first time we were getting on a lot of the pressure points, like the first drift. So you'd have to be really quick about it. And they really liked that cold water pushing in from the east. So, okay. yeah, definitely the Wahoo seemed to to like September, October, like that cooler water that was coming in for some reason. Mm-hmm. So whereas the mackerel seemed to be there all the time. Okay. I remember one day we just saw log after log of Wahoo and then <laughs> like the next trip only a week later there was just none and the water was totally different, a lot dirtier and a lot warmer. One one thing I'm picking up all through your interview is your observation skills. Um, how how have you do you consciously think about the conditions or do, is it the discussions before and after? What's kind of your process? I think the time that I become a lot more conscious of things like that was when I did a national titles because I had to be a lot more strategic of how I would approach ticking off a bunch of different species, but. Oh, just just trying to figure out the seasons. That's what started me thinking about it a lot more. It was um, why were why were we seeing fish this day and not the other day? Um, what are the factors that I should be looking for, or the times of year that I should be focusing more attention to? So once again, trying to work a little bit more smart, not hard, not just flogging out to those outer reefs every single trip and being, you know, successful only 2% of the time, whereas putting the effort in a shorter time of year and being more successful and then, you know, figuring out, yeah, just just being a lot smarter, like not burning Mm. all that fuel and and just, yeah, just wanting to get that fish. For sure. So have you you ever kept like a a spearfishing log? Sort of, but I'm pretty slack. I've I've kept it mostly in my brain. More than anything. Well, well, the good um, news, the good, the good news, news is, is no Spiro, Spiro have got, got a Spiro log up on Amazon. Oh, really? For you, you, you can, can buy a copy, a copy today. today. <laughs> so, Nikki, do, do I the plugs were at the end of the show. <laughs> do yourself a favour and get all those ideas out of your brain and on paper. Order today for nineteen ninety five. I'm so sorry that that happened. <laughs> nah, nah. That was my term for a dad-like infomercial, so I love it. But you that. know what's a really good way, and this is what I actually do, is photos. If you take photos of your fish, you can time, you know, they all have time stamps. So I've, yeah, like I can definitely do that. Sorry. I know it's, oh, I, it's raining no, on excellent. your log parade, but I have done no, that. That's good. Uh, I I actually found that I can go onto your Facebook photos and grab all the metadata as well. So, like, normally I find your marks. I you find are a creep. Here. Oh, he's a dead set creep. And it's not that he can do it, it's that he's done it. Yeah. This is, this is a past tense yeah, conversation. Yeah, I learned that in an online course, Creep 101. Um, <laughs> I've got it down. Yeah. I just, all right, Dad, calm down. And the... Um, yeah, I was going to say, but it's it's okay. Like, you can still buy the Spiro log because there's a little spot there where you can stick your printout photos in there. So, exactly um, right. So it's an app, just, is it? 
No, no, it's, no you a, just, it's a paperback You just go book. down to Office Works and print your photos out and stick it in the book there and write the date on it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> cute. <right. laughs> <laughs> well, there's a dude. There's a dude on Instagram, and he uh, saw the Spiro log, and he actually he actually said, um, "Dear diary, today I went out and shot nothing. I missed everything." <laughs> that's, that's, that was pretty good. So, g- g'day to the feather man. Yeah, um, it was that was the dude on Instagram. It was pretty bloody good. All right, Nikki, what what is your? I just um. Because I know your veterans' vault was pelagic fish. What's your what's your favourite pelagic fish to hunt? I love hunting tuna, but I I very much love hunting marlin. I think oh, I love eating tuna probably more. So probably tuna. Yeah. Probably tuna. Yeah. All right. Can we can we get a bit of an insight into uh, your, the the species that you like to hunt and how what that looks like? Um, well, up north there's dogtooth tuna and northern longtail tuna. Um, yellowfin are there, but they're not very common, and I've never shot one up there. Um, Tassie's got a brilliant southern bluefin tuna fishery, and I've only shot a yellowfin in Costa Rica, so I wouldn't say that's something I do very often. <laughs> just, just a- just a little name drop there. It's going to be in Costa Rica. Yeah, nice. Sorry. I'm, I'm well. No, 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 I'm that's, hashtag no, that's well travelled. They're just so delicious, you know. They're just and they're fast and, you know, they get your heart racing just because you've got to be ready and if you haven't taken that breath at the right instance, you miss them. You just, mm. yeah, you've got to, you've got to be ready at any time. And oh, the dog tooth are just such mean bastards of fish. <laughs> they just, oh, they ruin all your gear. You spend so much time trying to get them, and you still don't. It's just, yeah, yep. So, all right. So, doggies. You know, you must have a few tips on doggies. Well, um, I, I'm, I feel bad because I, I've never actually, I've lost many, but I've never landed a good one. So, I feel like I'm a bit of a, yeah, I shouldn't really be giving many advice, but I do know that you can't give them much to run on. You can't let them catch themselves up in the bombies you need short bungees you don't want your rig line too long because once they get in the reef they'll just tear themselves off or you'll lose them to sharks but yeah they're they're very aggressive and they love they love um heads of fish so if you're burling and stuff just hold on to that that head for the right time because they will come in on the heads oh good tip that is something we have never heard i like that that's, that's just a that's just a little chunk of gold you've given away. Yeah, that's a very good actionable tip. I'll send you the bill. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hey, look, let's let's wrap up the veterans' vault. Just any more parting tips or guidance for hunting pelagics, particularly for you know people that are you know just new into it. You will only be successful if you work as a team. Okay, oh, there we good. go. Love it. I love it. Noobspiro.com is the place to buy your next t-shirt from. You've probably looked in your drawer lately, you've got three or four and they're all tattered and ugly. Get a decent one this time, one you actually like wearing. Now these are comfortable shirts, we went through a couple of different versions before we settled on the, the shirts we like. The material's nice, it's quite nice in the summer when it's when it's hot, comfy against your skin. They feel good, get your hands on them at noobspiro.com. Let's let's move into the funniest thing. Uh, what is the funniest thing you've experienced out spearfishing? It's not that funny, but I did lend my bikini to a friend of mine who is a male. His name is Mick DeRoy, and we shot uh, five episodes of spearfishing um, as a fundraiser for the Australian in the Pacific team one year. So that was very, very funny watching him spear the reef in a bikini and a wig and lipstick. <laughs> Very nice. I was going to say, I've heard rumours of, of Mick DeRoy sprinting up Castle Hill. Oh, Is he's that a true? freak. Yeah. yeah, he's a freak. He's very fit and large. He's a large human. Yeah. He's a, he's a pretty good Spiro too in his own right, isn't he? Yeah, he is pretty good. But just ask him. He'll tell you how good he is. 
Uh, I hope, I hope, I hope he listens shy. to this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's got bird. No, he's good value. Yeah, it's good diving with him. And his daughters are getting to the age where they're getting keen too, so that's always fun to go out with them. With the, with the young women that are coming through, have you got some specific advice for them? Just get a nice, comfortable wetsuit that you feel warm in. Um, keep trying. Don't don't settle for this the first crew that you that you stumble upon. <laughs> and yeah, just just learn learn some basic things about boating, navigation, and and driving a boat, and try to understand drift lines. And yeah, just have and think about foresight and how you can work as a team or, or be a good Bodhi. I think anyone put yeah. that in that mind. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that's good advice for anyone really, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. For sure. The yeah. um the drift the drift line things are real that's very important, particularly up on the reef. Like I mean, if particularly when somebody can't just put you on the mark, like it's almost mm-hmm. unfair that that if you can put someone on the mark and you and you drop them in the water you know, you should be able to repay that favour because often the fish are in a spot, you know they're in a spot, and if you if you miss it by, you know, 50 metres or whatever, you're not going to shoot any fish. So it's just so – I find that so critical and um, and just so important to, to get right. I just yeah. don't think people can read it properly. Like it's more – they're not sure – they can't see that the difference in the wind taking the boat, that track, and what – your actual line of current is that's that's the massive difference yeah yeah i know um chris dillon was talking about like they they put out when they're running a drift line they put out markers um floats that they can line up and they hit them Mm -hmm. particularly if they're if they're running between two bombies Mm -hmm. and um you obviously haven't been listening to the New Spirit podcast, Nikki, but we'll, uh, I'm so sorry. This is very, it's well, very overlook disappointing. That. I live in a car. I don't have reception. But... Oh, that's perfect time <laughs> for listening. I you. You can download them on Wi-Fi and you can listen as you drive. <laughs> Plugs again. That was at the end. Oh, it's disgraceful, no, isn't it? No, yeah. we, we plug continuously. All right, hey, what? What's in your dive bag, Nikki? Um, head to toe, like you're down there in Adelaide at the moment. The water's wonderfully warm and, and tropical. What do you what have you got what have you got with you? Um, I've got a five and a half mil smooth skin wetsuit by Polo Sub, and I've got a one and a half mil smooth skin vest that I swap in underneath for the overcast days. And what are they? Three and a half mil booties. And I've got a 90 centimetre uh, aim right carbon gun, which is good because I can use that on the reef as well. It can handle um, the bigger shafts. A uh, real gun. I've got a set of carbon dive bar fins. And yeah, it's about what I'm using all the time. I've heard good things about Polo Sub. Um, Daniel Mann loves them. Bryson loves them. Seems like a bunch of those those guys there got on board those suits and they and they rave about them. Um, you, you're the same. They're good for women as well. Well, the best thing about them is they're custom and they're not much different in price to what you buy off the shelf. They're like minimal price difference. So for me, when you've got a slightly different shaped body in more ways than one, it, it's a massive difference. It keeps me so warm. There's other guys that are wearing seven mils this time of year down here and are cold, and I'm warm in a five and a half mil because it fits me properly. Yeah. So you can't complain, and and it's not as bulky either. Either, and if you're diving really really cold water, so I've got a eight and a half mil one that I wear. I wore in Tassie and I wore in Norway, and I've chosen to have eight and a half mil around the chest and seven mils on the arms just so it's not as bulky. So. You can really have whatever you want, and it's not much different in price. It's so comfortable, and, yeah, I'll never go back. All right, nice. What's a piece of equipment that's something a little different that you do? Hmm. Every, everyone's got tricks. <laughs> and uh, People into belt reels oh, still. You, you run, run one? one? I do. I like yep. it. I like it yep. for marking things, especially down here in the kelp. Uh, it's good for that. What do you mean, marking things? Oh, well, if you find a little hole, like a, a cray hole or yep. some, like a cave or something that's hidden by the kelp, you can yep. just clip it off to, say, the base of the kelp and run the line out because it's only shallow water. It's not like you're going to yeah. get 
caught up in it. And then, yeah. so, and then when you get to the surface, if you tighten the reel, uh, the reel on your belt reel, you can just see exactly where you need to dive down. So you're not wasting time and oxygen looking for this hole you just found. You can see exactly where it is by following your line down. That's awesome. That, that is a, another great tip. T- Turbo, what, what do you call crayfish holes? Crayals. <laughs> Crayals. <laughs> Uh, a crayon. Yeah, oh, it's perfect yeah. for marking out a crayon. Um, oh. uh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Daddy of uh, New Zealand. <laughs> we call them crayfish holes. Ch- and chili bins? What do you call them? <laughs> chili bins? No, no. Es- eskies and chili bins are different. Didn't you know that? Yeah, well, you never know what you... What do you call a grey hole? A, a, a cray hole. But he he calls it a cray hole. I don't know what happened to the H there, but it's not there. Um, but anyway, it's called, I digress. It's called streamlining. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm loving having a. I'm loving having another Queenslander on the show. You can get stuck. I, yeah. I, expect, <laughs> I expected you guys to gang up on me and more sheep jokes or something, but it's, it's been very quiet. Yeah. <laughs> we would never stoop that low, though. We don't do that. All right, let's get into sheepo Q and A. I mean Spiro Q and A. So oh, four dad jokes, yeah, oh, that was and a partridge, fun. and we're going to get five dad jokes in each episode. That's oh, a new rule, right? Um, okay, who is the best person to go spearfishing with, and why? I love diving with Bryson, but he's not my favorite. You know, there's heaps of good people. He's not. He's really convenient to dive with at the moment because he's always <laughs> with me, and we can always just dive and. Gee, you, you, you really G'd him up there. That was uh, No, he's, wow. he's very good and he's up for anything and we're of the same opinion. We're trying to get to these isolated places now and while the weather's good and, yeah, he's I love diving with him and he's patient and got my back and that's a good thing. T- Tim, Mack, what, what? T- Tim Mack had a lot to say about Bryce and he said he's – probably one of the other guys that could match him uh, ability-wise or one of the only guys. And so that's why he, lo- he loved diving with him as well. You know, how do you find diving with um, a guy with, you know, such phenomenal abilities? Because there's, there's probably only 100 of them in the country, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know how, how, how good your free diving fitness is, but, you know, I don't think I'd be able to keep up with them. That's, yeah. It's how definitely not as good as Tim. And my free diving ability is nowhere near as good as Tim and Bryson, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's not always about diving the deepest. It's about hunting. And, yeah, if anything that I've learned from diving with Bryson is it's not, yeah, it's, it's about working the area that you're in. Today we were, we were diving uh, an area near Port Lincoln and I think the deepest I'd dive today was 15 metres and the fish life was insane. It's just about finding the right areas and knowing how to work it. And yeah. they will, Bryson and Tim will always find it yeah. you can put them both in an area they've never died before and within a you know half an hour or whatever they'll they'll find it they just yeah, have so. such good fish sense yeah right. what spearfishing destination would you like to conquer next that you haven't already i have unfinished business in norway okay uh, go into that so well be- well you said you spoke to dan man recently but we were just there last september and yeah. Yeah. him and i didn't get a halibut so, yeah, I want to go back and get a big magic carpet. Yeah, nice. Get on the yeah. cover of Spearing Magazine yourself, eh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe Bryson can take a photo of me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yep. What, what is the single best piece of advice you've ever been given for spearfishing? If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Turbo, last question. Oh, yeah. So we're in uh, these, this thing of three great questions. All right. So, uh, uh, all right. Jeez. Oh, Who has been the most influential person or people in your spearfishing life? Oh, I don't know. I was hoping you wouldn't ask me this one. <laughs> oh, no. Is this an awkward one? No, it's all not right, awkward. We've... I just, I don't have, I don't have A one, anyone person. particular. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I've yeah. met so many people in the dive community that have given a little bit here and there that, yeah, like I just, I can't pinpoint anyone. I can't pinpoint. I think spearfishing is about taking in bits of knowledge wherever you go and there's so much out there. It's just everyone has something to offer. 
So I, I was, must say one. I was just going to echo your sentiments there. My experience has been similar, Nikki. And, um, you know, obviously apart from Noob Spiro and Shrek and Turbo, everyone else just has to do it little bit by bit. Otherwise, you know, um, they, yeah, there's only one Noob Spiro, basically. That's all I was saying. Uh, <laughs> 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 He's wrong with you. Uh, I'm having fun. <laughs> hey, um... <laughs> Hey, Nikki, pe- people can come and find you on Instagram. Um, what's your What's your handle on Instagram? What Bry, spelt W-A-T-T-B-R-Y, underscore, underscore. Okay, cool. I'll link that up in the show notes as well, so if people chuck in Nikki Watt and uh, the Noob Spirit interview will pop up in Google. Um, look, what else can people come and check out? You're on, uh, where else are you? What are you, what are you working on at the moment? Ah, uh, well, I'm on Facebook, but that's pretty boring these days. Yeah, most of the stuff you'll see what I'm up to is on on Instagram. Really, I'm just traveling Australia at the moment, so yeah, I'm not up to much apart from trying to dive everywhere and see everything before I die. Oh, nice one. Yeah. Yeah, no, I've been following along on Insta. I like your little travels. You you guys are. Uh... You guys are quickly surpassing Spearfishing's other power couple, um, Crips and to Catch. Oh! And it's a it's a it's a real battle. It's a oh, real battle. I, I mean, you that. guys are really getting out there, and I don't know. I think I think Tacker and Crips. Uh, we could see a we could see a fight back soon. I don't know. Bryce Tacker. would love to hear that because him and Tacker have this rivalry, and he's probably going to call. Tacker after I get off the phone to you guys and be like, suck shit, Tacker, because, yeah. <laughs> Tacker Crips first, what, bro? Yeah. Jesse's actually like one of the other good people to dive with because we're both girls and we get it, so. Ah, uh, they're awesome. They're awesome, those no, two. They're, they're I just, I just, excellent couple. I just watched one of their Patreon videos, um, Underwater Ally Productions. They had that um, how to how to cook an abalone and squid up, and uh, they had a couple of magic little techniques in that video. Um, yeah, they they're, they're awesome. Those two. Yeah, they've got some good recipes for sure. Yeah, what have you guys got going on in the recipe department since we've got this huge battle going on? Ah. Uh- <laughs> oh god put me on the spot i've i've become pretty good uh, at cooking scallops thank you tasmania right. i want to see it is it on youtube no nah, it doesn't exist then i'm sorry oh well if you were following our instagram stories you should be all over it oh, yes. oh, I, I know oh, good, i actually good. know that you guys are into the scallops um because i've been following along but so just one last uh little i just want to know out of both couples who can drink the most rum because I know Taka <laughs> and Chris <laughs> and Crips are pretty good. Well, it depends what type of rum because Taka's a big Bundy fan, as oh, am I, yeah, and Jesse and Bryson hate it, and they hate it especially when we have rum, Bundy rum, <laughs> that is. <laughs> they won't talk to us if we're drinking it. Oh, so no. I'm going to say Taka and I. Okay. Yeah, right. Nice. Yeah. Case, I like it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Hey, Awesome chat, Nikki. Um, we've had a had a had a good chat today. Lots of information, some hot tips. Uh, we will we will completely reimburse you for for them. <laughs> thanks for having me. It's been fun. <laughs> Absolutely awesome. All right, thanks, Nikki. Enjoy your travels around Australia with Bryson. Um, we want to get him on the show as well to get his uh, perspective at some point. And, and Greg and, Pickering uh, too while you're there. Oh, don't forget Greg. All right, no worries. I'll pass the message on. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks, Nikki. <laughs> we are ruthless. All right, thanks, Nikki. <laughs> Wow, that was a that was an awesome chat with Nikki, and uh, really enjoyed just the banter. And uh, she's a real character. It's great to hear hear some of her mindsets and the, the ways she looks at and analyzes and observes things in the ocean, and everything from equipment to hunting techniques. So I really just enjoyed that. And uh, hearing the story of that big marlin was really cool and special as well. Look, you heard about a couple of the other people we might be eyeing up in the next few months, but at this stage we've got nothing confirmed for the next uh, interview in two weeks' time. But uh, we'll, we will see you there. We will have a quality interview, I'm sure. So thanks for tuning into the new Spiro podcast today, guys. Look, leave us a review wherever you listen to the show. It helps people find it. Tell them mate about it. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Android, iPhone, whatever you got, you can find the new Spiro podcast. Subscribe, leave a review. Legends. Thanks, guys.
Guys, finally a magazine Turbo won't get in trouble with his girlfriend for reading. <laughs> Bearing Magazine, it's the world's best spearfishing magazine, and they kindly sponsored the new Spear Podcast, which, funnily enough, is the world's best podcast. Oh, it's so. a match made in heaven. <laughs> Together at last. Join Sparing Magazine on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, and connect with sparingmagazine.com. Guys, in today's episode, we discussed getting cold. Now, this is not uncommon. Most of us will experience cold if we do spearfishing for long enough. Now, to overcome being cold, you can get your hands on a good set of booties, gloves, and a wetsuit. Super important, and it's always that compromise between durability and comfort. But head over to spearfishing.com.au and check out a full range of wetsuits. And uh, the thing I like about shopping online, sometimes you can review, you can read a lot of product reviews and get an idea of exactly what you're buying. Now, our show sponsor, spearfishing.com.au, have got a comprehensive list of products with reviews from people just like you and I. So get on there, check out an awesome range of gear, and if you do decide to buy something, pump in the code NoobSpiro at checkout, save $20 on every purchase over $200 at spearfishing.com.au. Thanks for supporting us, guys. Mm-hmm.